What's going on everybody? I am here to do a review for Marvel Studios Eternals. Eternals is basically, it's a, I would say Eternals is like a whole new structure of a MCU type of film. I can't really count uh, which MCU film this is, but I know it is in the 20s somewhere. Someone can let me know down in the comments exactly um, where it falls. So basically Eternals, they're basically talking about uh, basically almost the beginning of time when it comes to these particular characters right here basically what goes on is they were created by celestial beings if you follow the mc the celestials were introduced in i believe guardians of the galaxy i believe the first guardians of the galaxy back in 2014 they kind of touched on them a little bit but here they're actually talked about a little bit more they were basically beings that were created and their mission is basically to go to different worlds and protect those worlds from what is called or what are known as deviants with basically these hideous looking creatures that come to these worlds in order to uh ravish the world with its inhabitants and basically take over and do that from place to place or planet to planet location to location and basically that's their mission the only thing is is that they cannot interfere with any human conflicts unless deviants are involved and that was one of the biggest things people wanted to know what was going to like what was the, the biggest question people had where were the Eternals the entire time when they were dealing with the threat of Thanos and other things in the world? And of course, they, answer, they kind of answered it in, in the last trailer that they had, but then they go even further into it right here. And it basically was saying if the Eternals in, interfered with any type of conflict, then that means that it would have hindered the growth of humanity, which makes sense because then it's like, they don't really go through anything. It's almost like everything was perfect for them. Like they never had any conflict. They never had to really go through anything. But then of course, as the movie progresses, you realize that it was like, we should have interfered because look at what the turnout was. This is what it ended up turning out to be. It, it, it's like, it's almost like they were sent on a false mission to do one thing, thinking that they were doing something completely different. So that's basically like the scope of the movie. They basically, you know, were together. They were a group. It's 10 of them. And, you know, they worked together. Then they disbanded and separated and, you know, went their separate ways for centuries. These beings are thousands of years old. They look like human beings, but they're not. And they're, like I said, they've been around for centuries. And they've seen and heard and done a lot of things while they were here on Earth. All they really wanted to do was just finish the mission on Earth, take out all the deviants, and then they will be able to go back home to their planet known as Olympia. But uh, let's just say that their place does not really actually exist. And then they find out some other things and then it's like, it's one major conflict after another. So that's basically the scope of the whole, uh, you know, a small synopsis of the movie. I don't wanna like really spoil anything because really in this review, what I wanna do is go through each Eternal character and basically tell you who they are what their abilities are, and what I thought of their characters. So the first person I want to talk about, and forgive me if I don't know the actors and actresses' names uh, for the uh, different characters that I'm talking about, but some of them I know by hand, by uh, offhand, and some of them I can't really think of their names. But the first person I want to talk about is Icarus. Icarus is like, He's been compared to like the Superman of the group, mainly because he's able to fly, he has super strength, and he can shoot the lasers out of his eyes. And he's basically like, he, like I said, he's a huge, strong person of the group. He, you know, like I said, he flies, shoots the beams out of his eyes. He has super strength. Like I said, he's literally like Marvel's version of Superman. And speaking of, they kind of make a little bit of a joke with that Superman thing in the movie with, uh, with the Fastos character with his son they actually kind of alluded to that in one of the commercials so that's really not much of a spoiler in and of itself and basically what i thought of his character is wow this is a dope character right here you know marvel has their own version of a superman but then as the story goes on and you look at the development of his character you realize this guy is kind of shady not well not even kind of he is and he's he pretty he's almost like a snake like when you actually put it down like like put it on the table like this is the type of character that he actually is and it's just crazy how he did a complete like 180 damn near a whole 360 when um when it all comes down to it and you know how do you deal with something with a being like that 
you know, he, you know, goes around, he saves everybody and everything like that. And then on the back end, you find out he's like, it's almost like he made a deal with the devil at the same time. It's like, wow. So that for me was a bit of a plot twist, unless that's something that they kind of alluded to or pulled from the comics. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't read the Eternals comics. I didn't really know much about these characters going into this movie because, like I said, this is new territory for me. They weren't fleshed out like the characters we've seen before, like your Iron Mans and your Thors and your Spider Mans and your Captain Americas and so on, the ones that we are very familiar with. So that's the Icarus character right there. The next character I want to talk about, her name is Cersei. Um, Cersei is basically her ability is that she can turn anything into um, some kind of a matter. Like in the trailer you saw, she was able to turn a bus that was about to crash into rose petals. She was able to make water come from her hands. She's a, She was able to, you know, liquefy a, a whole tree. Like she was able to turn a statue into sand. So that's basically what she's able to do. And her role in, um, in Eternals is that she ends up becoming the leader of the group after one of the characters, I'm gonna get to that character eventually. She ends up becoming the lead of the group. She's on, uh, she is in a relationship with the Icarus character while also, well, she had a relationship with him before they disbanded and went their ways. And now she's with this character by the name of Dane Whitman. And I'm gonna get to his character a little bit later on. She basically is living out in the world. She's a teacher or a professor at a particular school. That's basically her cover. And, you know, she basically, she is worried how did she ended up getting chosen to be this leader. And the reason why she became the leader is because they feel that the people who love the people of Earth so much should be the ones that lead the people. If you, if you are inhabiting Earth or wherever it is you are and you don't have love for the people or the beings that are in it, then why would you lead? Because you would just lead the people into... Uh, like into hell at that point so they figure she would be the perfect person to actually take on that leadership role and basically her mission is she now is able to communicate with Erish and the judge who was like the main celestial of the movie he's that big red being i always thought that their heads look like dominoes because of the, the the six light dots that come down the three on each side of their heads i always compare them to like a like a uh like a six domino and that's basically what she has to do and she has to basically keep or prevent the emergence from happening and basically the emergence um what that is is the emerge of another celestial being coming into earth and if the celestial being comes into earth them just being on earth will explode earth and then that's a particular um place that's taken down and then they just go on and move on to the next galaxy or the next planet and pretty much do the same thing because i think they said the emergence the emergence happens like every hundred years but what happened was with the snap with thanos and in infinity war it delayed the emergence and when <coughs> the events of endgame happened and tony stark snapped everyone back and well not tony stark but when um hulk snapped everybody back in it brought everybody back and then that's when the emergence went back into rotation so that's basically the oh, another premise of the movie that I forgot to mention is they have to prevent the emergence of another celestial being from coming into Earth, thus exploding the Earth and then wiping out everybody on Earth, like in a way that Thanos snap with the Infinity Gauntlet could never do. So that's pretty much the Cersei character. The next character I wanted to talk about was Thena. Thena is played by Angelina Jolie. Um, in the movie, she's referred to as the goddess of war. Basically, she is a warrior goddess. She basically is put there to fight and she, the, her abilities is that she can wield weaponry and armor so she can fight the deviants. I like the fighting style that they use with Angelina, even though I can tell a lot of it was a, it was a, for me or from what I saw, I think it was a little bit too much CGI for her. It wasn't like it was practical, but you got to think Angelina Jolie is not in her Tomb Raider age like she was back in the early 2000s where she could do a lot of practical movements of herself. And then some of the stuff I wouldn't expect her to do right there, but she's basically the like the warrior of the group. She's the fighter. She can wield weapons. And sidebar, in the comics, Athena is actually the cousin of Thanos. I thought they would allude to that in this movie, but unfortunately they did not. Or maybe they did and I missed it, but I, from what I saw, and I was trying my best to pay as much close attention and not miss anything as I could. 
and I did not hear them mention anything about her being related to Thanos. But in the comics, she is indeed Thanos' cousin. So there is a relationship between them two then, which a lot of people were saying, well, I thought Thanos was a was a deviant and some mixed with something else. Then why didn't they come and deal with him then? But I forgot the reason as to why they couldn't even interfere with that because I don't think he was a full, he's not a full blown, a full blooded deviant. He's half deviant, half something else, half from whatever it is from the planet of Titan. And that's probably why they couldn't really go after him because he was quote unquote mixed. But that's basically her character. Um, what I thought of her character, you could um, she dealt with a lot of issues. Like she basically was dealing in with a, she was dealing with a lot of internal conflict, more so the external. And I thought that was interesting that they gave her that flaw because on the outside she's exterior tough, but internally she's fighting something that she can't even deal with herself. Like it's, she she is fight. I forgot what they call. It. I think it was called the wear the. The weary, the bad weary, or something. Somebody can correct me down with it in below, but it's basically when something just kind of takes over her when she gets into a moment to the point where she stops fighting against the deviants and she starts turning on the Eternals and she just goes beast mode to the point where it's kind of scary. Her eyes turn white and then she just goes in and then basically it takes the next character I'm gonna talk about to basically take her out of that state. And the character that I'm about to talk about is Gilgamesh. And when I heard that name, Gilgamesh, it reminded me of the story that titled that, where I had to read in a high school called Gilgamesh. So I was familiar with the name, but I didn't know he was a Marvel character. And Gilgamesh, um, in this movie, he basically is, he's almost like the Hulk of the group. He's very strong. Like, the way that he was punching those deviants and just knocking them back with those punches and them hits and everything like that was just crazy. It's amazing the amount of strength that he has. Um, also, his character has a relationship with Thena, even though they didn't expound on it to the point where they show any type of intimacy or romance between the two of them. But you can tell that they were romantically linked because they were always like kind of close to each other and not in a buddy, buddy, best friend type of way, but almost like a boyfriend, girlfriend type of uh, relationship. So, you know, that's basically what it was. And he always says, I'm going to protect you no matter what. And, you know, she and we could tell with her character, she was very vulnerable around him. Like you could tell she allowed herself to kind of submit to him where she was kind of more on the tough exterior with everyone else. But with him, she was willing to like kind of submit to him in a way that she wouldn't do. Um, with anybody else, but I did like the Gilgamesh character. He was very tough. When like I just like seeing him just like punch and knock those deviants back, just like knock. I mean, he was throwing some haymakers. One, I remember in one clip he hit the deviant so hard the deviant flipped over by him hitting it like this, and it flipped over that way. But so I thought that was very dope with his character. It was unfortunate what happened with his character, but I'm gonna leave that to y'all to figure that out if y'all don't see it. Um, the next character I wanted to talk about was, and I want to make sure that I'm getting these people correct, is Kingo. Now, Kingo was definitely the comedic relief of this movie, mainly because of the actor that played him. The actor that played him is known for doing comedic roles in comedic movies. So I'm glad that, you know, they were able to allow him to keep the comedic element there, even though he's playing a superhero basically kingo he's able to shoot these um energy blasts out of his fingers he's able to do the, some people say he's doing the the uh, kamahameha you know what i'm talking about from dragon ball z and he's shooting and it almost looks like it too because of the way that he holds it and then shoots it and blasts it off like that and basically his cover is, is he's now living as a bollywood actor a world famous bollywood actor who's been around for many years and he uses the cover that from um from time to time one was his great grandfather, one was a grandfather, then one was a father, and, the, and then the others were him just to cover his tracks because it was like, how in the world is this guy able to uh, uh, transcend through time and people not suspect anything? And you know, this guy is not aging. So I thought that was very interesting. Like I said, he was a comedic relief for the movie. He he pretty much had most of the funny lines of the entire movie, but he was also still a very a uh, decent combatant fighter with the ability, like I said, to shoot the energy bat, um, beams or blast out of his fingertips and throw them and everything like that. So I thought that was um, dope. I also thought he had one of the most convenient powers because it's like all he has to do is shoot, is have his fingers out like this and just and just blast or just shoot something off like that. So I thought he had a very convenient power. Uh, the next character I wanted to talk about was Druig. Um, Druig is basically, he's a mind manipulator. 
He can get inside of your mind, almost like a Professor X. That's what I guess that's the best way to put it. He can get inside your mind, control your thoughts, and basically make you do anything that he wants you to do. And Druig was the type of character that he was so, you know, he was so crucial to the group um, that he was one of the first people that kind of went against, or I guess you could say rebelled against the orders of Erich and the Judge of don't interfere with human conflicts unless deviants are involved because you can tell he really wanted to help the people he was like this is not he doesn't feel like this is a mission that we're supposed to be on he feels like this isn't a mission we're supposed to be doing i feel like we're supposed to be doing more to actually help these people because this doesn't look like help to me this looks like we're aiding in their genocide and this is not what i signed up for so he was like one of the first ones to rebel against the group way back in the day and you can tell he still had that rebellious spirit about it and i'm not even gonna lie i thought he was gonna turn on the group by just by his actions but he proved me wrong and he was a very crucial part of the group because like i said the fact that he could link to so many people at one time and just let and make them do whatever he wanted was just simply genius like i said like professor x but the thing is with professor x you know, he has to use Cerebro to link to as many minds as possible around the world. Whereas Druid could do that just by look just by looking at them and just controlling many minds at one time. Like it was a part in the movie where he just linked to so many minds and made them all stop fighting in the war. He walked down some steps and he walks out of where the war was at and all the people who were fighting followed him. That's just how powerful that he, you know, how powerful he is. Like he could literally draw up an army to defend him at any given time, just on the ability of being able to control their minds and their thoughts. So the next character I wanted to talk about was Ajak. Ajak is the leader, I guess you could say the mother of the Eternals before she meets, you know, her demise. Spoiler alert. Uh, she um, basically you know, she's the one that answers to Erish and the judge. She's the one that communicates with them pretty much every single time over the years. She, she's the one, she's like the first to command. Uh, she basically carries out his orders or she's like the messenger and sends them to her. Her ability is that she heals. She's a healer. And I thought that was dope that you know that they have uh, a, a woman play the character of a healer when you think about it. And that was one p issue that some people had with the movie is that they gender swapped some characters her character being one of them because uh uh the ajax character was originally a guy in the comics and they decided to swap it out and have a woman player and it that was played by selma hayek and like i said basically she's the healer of the group and she loves the people of earth like she feels that she, like she knows that traveling from different places that she knows that um the people are like uh in those other places but Earth, was her, for her, felt special. And she felt like she should have been able to try to help save these people. And she can tell she's conflicted with doing the orders of Erish and the Judge, but she really doesn't want to do those orders. But she has to, in order to continue, I guess, hold her rank and still hold the group together and all things like that. Because the one thing about the Eternals is that there's so many of them, but it's just that these, it's, it's focused on, these, on this core right here. It's not like, oh, it's just... These are the only Eternals on Earth. No, they were created. It's a whole bunch of them. It's so many. Like they could do so many stories with um with the Eternals beyond what we got with this movie. It's so many of them. But like I said, she's basically the healer of the group. Whenever someone's injured, she can heal them. If someone's near death and she's near them and can save them, she can heal them. Like right there on the spot. It's almost like having a um a hospital in a person. Like that's basically what she um is able to do. Uh, the next uh, eternal character that I want to talk about was Sprite. Now, back to the gender swapping thing. Sprite in the comics was originally a boy, and but in the movie they made Sprite a girl. Now, Sprite's ability is that she's able to create illusions. Like she can literally make any turn anything into anything that's what it's really not. She can create areas that are not there. She can make you and people go invisible, which she did quite a bit in this movie. She can create images and all types of stuff so it's a pretty dope ability but it's also one of her biggest flaws is because i believe that she uses a lot of her abilities sometimes to cover up how she really feels now like i said these eternals are thousands of years old but she is the only eternal that is stuck in the body of a little girl everyone else is an adult a grown woman or a grown man but she's the only one that's got stuck in the body of a little girl kind of reminds me of esther from orphan she's a grown woman but she's stuck in a girl's body and that's a conflict for her because she feels that 
She's not able to do adult things. She's not able to love or be in love or have love in an intimate way because no one's going to ever see her that way because they're always going to see her as a girl no matter where she goes through in life. She, she'll she never grow. She's always going to be stuck looking like a child. And that for her was a conflict, especially at a point in the movie with her and Cersei. But I'm not going to go too much into that. But that's her hang-up right there. But that's also her ability. She can create illusions, but her hang-up is that she can't grow up. She she's, she's stuck looking like a child. And that's her conflict. The next character I wanted to talk about was Fastos. Now, Fastos was played by um, Brian Tyree Henry, who, of course, we all know from Atlanta. He was in God, Godzilla vs. King Kong. Um, he was in a few other things, you know, pretty much doing well for himself. And here's where the conflict was for me when I first learned of this movie. Because they kept saying, uh, well, you know, before I actually get into that, let me just get into his abilities. Fasto's character is able to, he's like the builder. He can build weapons. He can build ships. He can build just about anything. He actually proved himself to be very useful in this movie when it came down to taking out the emergence. Like he played a huge part in that particular uh, sphere. So like I said, he's the builder of the group. He builds weapons. He builds artillery. He builds machinery he he practically is the one that designed that ship that they travel in so he basically like i said he's the builder of the group and one thing i had to correct myself on fastos in the comics when they you know in the first run of the comic is a black character so they did get that right they did not race swap his character because fastos was always a black character but over the years they kind of made him look ethnically ambiguous but he was he's a black character so they did get that right they didn't gender swap him because he's a guy now the issue was when it came to the first promotion of the movie was that they made his character a part of Hall G, which is, you know, in the Academy, which in the comic, they he was never that way or they never specify how he leaned. But they never said that he was this way, though. But they just do it in there. And now they said, oh, he's the first openly gay Marvel superhero. And when they led into that with that, when they led with that, and I'm like, okay, we're about to talk about the Eternals. What's this movie going to be about? Because these are some new crop of characters I'm not too sure about. But they kept leaning on him saying, oh, we're so excited because we're about to introduce the first openly Marvel gay superhero. And it's going to be, a, he's going to have a husband, a kid, and he's going to have the first gay kiss in a Marvel movie. And I was like, that's it. That's what you're leaning with with this film. Like, you know, nothing else about the other characters and nothing about his powers, nothing about what he does, nothing what he contributes to the group. Just that. That's it. That's all they led with. I kid you not. Like, if you go back and look at those earlier articles, that's what they led with with his character. And that kind of like turned me off a little bit. And I was like, that, oh, really? Like, huh? Are you serious? And then I'm going into the movie and I'm like, OK, they about to do this kiss thing. And when I tell you, that kiss that they built up to make it seem like it was going to be oh, so grandiose only lasted like two to three seconds. It was like a little peck, if you want to call it that. So they built all of that up. Mind you, they had a whole sex scene in this movie between the Cersei and Icarus character. Small spoiler alert. And they didn't talk about that at all in any of the promotions, but they talked about that kiss. So that just lets you know. See, that's the issue right there that many people have with Marvel and most recently DC. Don't shoehorn something into the story that one was not there to begin with and two that would not help guide the story along. Him having a kiss with his husband and him having a child with his husband did nothing with his story. It's just okay. He went out to the world. He got married to a man and he has a son. So what that, like that's pretty much how i felt about it when i saw the when i was watching this movie and i think a lot of other people in the audience felt the same way too because when the kiss happened nobody was like Ugh, or anything like that or oh like actually it was no reaction it was like that was it okay keep moving on let's continue with the movie that's pretty much how people um received it and that's how i received it because it was like they made it seem like it was going to be this major major thing we got a big reaction with the sex scene because marvel which is owned by disney I don't think they've ever had a sex scene in any of their movies. So to actually see that was kind of, you know, interesting. So, but yeah, so it is what it is. Like I said, that was my gripe early on with the, um, with the film was with that part right there. And it was really nothing. 
to be quite honest. And I'm just telling y'all this right now. Y'all can choose to believe it or not, but it is what it is. But we know an agenda when we see one. And that definitely is, is right there. So the last eternal that I wanted to talk about. Well, before I get to that last person, let me talk about the Dane Whitman character. Dane Whitman, played by Kit Harrington, known aka Jon Snow from uh, Game of Thrones. And by the way, interestingly enough, the guy who played Icarus also played um, Rod. Uh, his, his name is Ron Snark, Stark. Somebody let me know. Is it Ron, Ron Snark, Stark from Game of Thrones? They were in the movie together. Now, I will say this. When they actually have some time to be on screen together with each other and they meet up for the first time, I felt that was kind of forced to me. It did feel kind of forced that they met the way that they did. It was like, oh, by the way, here you have two uh, popular Game of, Thrones, uh, Game of Thrones characters. Here they are. And they kind of looked like they were having a staring contest before they had any dialogue. So I felt that part was kind of forced. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Dane Whitman, played by Kit Harrington, Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. He basically is the guy that's currently in a relationship with Cersei. And that's pretty much it. But his character, Dane Whitman, if you know the comics, is going to be very crucial and very important to the eternal storyline going forward. And I cannot wait to see what's going to happen, especially with after what that post credit scene showed. <clears throat> and I'm not going to say what it did. But... I noticed that in the movie, he's in the beginning of the movie. Then he's out of the movie for like a long period of time. They kind of do a FaceTime conversation with him and Cersei. And you don't see him at all anymore. Because one of the last things she tells him is do some research on your family. Especially, I think, with your uncle. Just do some research on that. And then after that, you don't see him at all. At all. In the movie until like the last five to ten minutes of the movie and then that's when you see him again and then he just basically tells Cersei I did some research like you said on my family and I found some interesting things and then something happens and he can't he couldn't tell her the rest excuse me he couldn't tell her the rest of what happened but I'm not going to tell you what happened but something happens and it happens right in the dead of him getting ready to tell her what he found out which is definitely going to lead to where his character arc is headed going forward so that's basically Dan Whitman so <coughs> The last Eternal that I want to talk about, and I said, I was going to save my favorite Eternal for last. And looking at the previews, I already knew that this person was going to be my favorite Eternal. And that is none other than Makari. Makari, hands down, was my favorite Eternal. And I think that's probably a lot of people's favorite Eternal. Makari's abilities are, they're a speedster. That's pretty much it. They are a speedster. They run very, very, very fast. And I like the effects that they use to amplify Makari's speed and looks and everything like that. <coughs> y'all got it, excuse me. It's not what y'all think. It's not that. Um, so, this was also another thing where people was like, oh, they gender swapped again because in the comics, Makari was a man. And But I recently found out that in a more recent edition of the Eternals comics, they did make uh, Makari into a woman. And not only that, but they made history with this character, at least in the MCU. Because not only did they make they, they made Makari a, uh, a a woman, even though in the recent comics she did become a woman. But this is the first um, deaf Marvel superhero. Which in the comics, the more recent one where they made her a woman was deaf as well. This is the first deaf Marvel superhero and... The actress who plays her is also deaf. So I thought that was very interesting and it added some authenticity to this character as well. Um, and the actress, I remember first seeing her on The Walking Dead when she came, I think she appeared on The Walking Dead as a new character a couple seasons back. But it was about around that time when I was getting ready to like kind of get off of The Walking Dead. Like I was kind of moving away from it. I was away from The Walking Dead at that point. I was over it. It was like the storylines was getting kind of uh after a while but i really loved her character she was hands down my favorite eternal especially like at the towards the end where she was really going in with her powers and the, the speedster moves and everything like that whole thing just had me was like yes that's what i wanted to see with her uh character and one thing i liked is that they did not play on her 
being deaf as a crutch to make her seem like she needed help. They didn't make her into a damsel in distress. Like she literally was able to fight. Like she's actually one of the warriors. Like she's actually part of the fighting crew because what the Eternals in the breakdown is you have five fighters and five thinkers. She's one of the five fighters. And I just like, I like, I really loved her like abilities and everything like that. I really did love her character. Makari, hands down, is probably, like I said, <clears throat> my favorite Eternal. Hands down. So, I think I just went through every Eternal in this movie. Um, one thing I did like about the movie is the locations. Like, they, you can tell the budget for this movie was huge just on the locations they chose to use alone. I mean, I can't even... Think of all the places they went. But I think they did most of the filming for this movie outside of the States. <coughs> Y'all got to excuse me. I think most of the filming for this movie was outside of the States. Because when I was looking at the credits, I didn't see anything there that said anything U.S. related. There was a lot of abroad sh um, shots that they did. So that budget was huge. They did a phenomenal job on capturing all of that. The scenery was beautiful. I, I just knew this was going to be a beautiful movie anyway, just looking at the visuals. The visuals was very well done. The CGI was very good. It didn't look choppy or cheesy, even though some of it with Angelina Jolie's character did kind of look a little bit choppy, but everything else was good. The deviants design, they looked very sinister, like something you would not want to see in a back alley. That's something you wouldn't even want to see in broad daylight. But <clears throat> yeah, the direction was good it was a very pretty good solid movie like i said it had its moments with that i you know didn't like one thing i'm glad they did not do was try to make it seem like everybody was oblivious to what happened after the snap so what i mean by that is that people are aware that something like the eternals might have even existed even if they're trying to psychologically say in their mind that it did not exist but they're saying that that most likely did. I like that they referenced the snap. So it's not like they're ignoring what happened. They are acknowledging what happened because it did happen. And not to make it seem like, oh, a snap happened and y'all went back to sleep and woke up and your memories was gone. That would have been cheesy. So I'm glad that in these mo these more these phase four movies that they are acknowledging what is going on or what has happened and what has led them to this present day moment. So I do really like that they kept that aspect um, in the in these movies. But that's pretty much my review for Eternals. This was a long review. I'm looking at the clock. I'm at 32 minutes. This is probably one of my longest movie reviews of But when you're going through a group of characters, that's what happens. But that's my take on Marvel Studios Eternals. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Is this a movie that y'all will go see? Is this a movie that y'all will pass? I know some people, you know, felt some type of way because of the agenda and everything like that. But like I said, they overhyped it. It was really absolutely, in my opinion, it was damn near nothing compared to what they may try to make it seem like. But that's just me. But y'all let me know what y'all think about it down in the comments, and I'll talk to you in the next one.